What's up guys, it's Dolmatter here, and today we're going to be reacting to a new channel. This is History Dose. Uh, I've never heard of these guys, but they actually have about just shy of a million, well, about half a million followers. Um, just over half a million. And this is what a samurai versus Mongol battle really looked like. Um, I didn't think they ever fought, though. I thought both times the Mongols got taken out by typhoons before they even landed. Maybe I was wrong there. Um, maybe there was another, you know, maybe just that was only during Genghis. They might have had another conflict at some point, but I'm not entirely sure. But anyway, link to the original video down below. And yeah, let's jump into it because this seems really interesting. The islanders of Tsushima noticed them first. The dark figures cutting across the Pacific horizon one evening in 1274. Local okay, so governor So Sukakuni knows what's coming. He rallies 80 mounted samurai and leads them through the mountains toward the beach. The invasion fleet lurches forward. The samurai look outnumbered. Six years ago, the Mongol ruler Kublai Khan, grandson of Genghis Khan, sent a letter to Japan's Kamakura government. Innumerable people in far off lands have learned to fear our power and have longed for our virtuous rule. Moreover, the sages consider the entire universe one family. Therefore, if we should not establish friendly relations with each other, how could it be in accordance with the doctrine of one family? Who would care to appeal to arms? <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's kind of fun. Like that, that message almost seems like it would be written today um, by like somebody using mental gymnastics to like justify like kind of uh, neo-colonialism. Seemingly an offer to peacefully submit to Kublai Khan and become subjects of the Mongols. Yet to reject his proposal is to flirt with Apocalypse Holocaust. The sublime cities of the Islamic world, opulent kingdoms of Russia, mighty domain of Imperial China, have been defiled, burned, gutted. Millions of men, women, and children butchered by the Mongols. I mean, opulent kingdoms of Russia at this point in history is not exactly how I would portray them. Um, they were, like, barely even in the medieval age. <laughs> I know some Russians are going to get pissed about that. But, like, e Eastern Europe historically has been a huge, like, has been a backwater. Um, with the, I guess, kind of the exception of, like, the, you know, the Soviet Union. They were, you know, the superpower. I guess the, the Russian Empire, you know, near the end was also kind of a superpower, you know, during the Great Game with uh, the, the British Empire and stuff like that. But at this point in history, especially, like, you know, the further you went east in Europe, to a large degree, the less advanced it got, with the exception of the southeast, and like the, you know, the Greeks and the Ottomans and the, the Byzantines and stuff like that. For unknown reasons, Kublai Khan has decided that Japan should now bend the knee to his empire. Japan's government responds by ignoring his letter. So Sukakuni is first to suffer the consequences. At dawn, a thousand Mongols charge the beach. Samurai are masters of the blade, but they are first and foremost horse archers. The Japanese fight in small, disparate bands of samurai warriors and their followers. They prefer to pick off individual targets at range. This initially works against the Mongols, and Tsushima's defenders cut down many of the oncoming invaders. But Mongol tactics are foreign and overwhelming. Mongol domination has come on the backs of battle-worn nomads trained in horse archery since childhood. They launch synchronized charges in units, raining mass volleys of arrows down on clumps of enemies. When the exhausted enemy herds begin to thin, they charge the gaps and look to finish the battle with axes and swords. Here, the samurai's mastery of both grappling on horseback and unmounted sword warfare becomes crucial. In the melee, one samurai shatters his sword, and a shower of Mongol arrows kill him. The defenders of Tsushima are outnumbered. The bodies of Sukakuni and his followers are left on the beach, and by midday, the Mongol invasion of Tsushima is unstoppable. Local buildings are burned, inhabitants slaughtered. Yeah, so I had never even heard of this. I had no idea, like, I knew that they had attempted it, uh, I believe twice, but I thought both of them failed before they even landed. The Mongols do the same to the island of Iki before advancing toward the oh. mainland. Maybe that's what the mainland is probably what people are referring to with it failing. The fleet comes into view and drops anchor, revealing the Mongol flair for psychological warfare. Their bows are adorned with female islanders dangling from a rope strung through their palms. 
God damn, An that's onslaught of hard. Mongol horse archers charge the beach to the tune of signals from gongs and drums. They launch ear-splitting gunpowder bombs, sending Japanese horses staggering backward. Then they swing hooks and other weapons to rip the Japanese from their mounts. The Mongols generally navigate the battlefield wearing versatile light armor and carrying personal shields, while the more heavily armored samurai only use shields as stationary protective walls for their archers. The samurai are relentless sharpshooters. Their counterattacks force some of the Mongols to retreat and regroup. Yeah, so that's actually one thing that I don't think a lot of people know about the samurai. Usually we, you know, in the West, I think we associate samurai to a large degree with, you know, the sword. Right, samurai swords are like incredibly famous, um, it, you know, both in like hi history circles and in pop culture. Uh, but the samurai, for most of their history, were actually much more known for being archers. Uh, it's it's kind of a like twentieth and twenty first century pop culture thing of the samurai being mainly blade warriors. They were actually mainly archers, which kind of makes sense because if you think about it, like it's a lot more useful to be good with a bow than it is to be good with a sword in warfare right um yeah one samurai takazaki suenaga is eager to make a name for himself japanese warriors are compensated by the shogunate government only when they can offer proof of their own exceptional deeds proof which often takes the form of eyewitness accounts or enemy heads Suenaga has tracked the retreating Mongols to an encampment. One of his followers warns him not to charge, to wait for reinforcements. But Suenaga answers, The way of the bow and arrow is to do what is worthy of reward. Charge! The Mongols let fly a volley of arrows, wounding Suenaga and his three retainers. Suenaga presses on until an arrow drills into his horse and he's thrown to the ground, helpless. Suddenly, a charge of reinforcements storms forward, saving his life. The Mongol counterattack is brutal. The Japanese scatter and retreat inland while the invaders lay waste to many of the homes and shrines along the coast. And then they leave. There appears to have been a storm prior to their departure. Some accounts claimed it wrecked much of the Mongol fleet, while others state it was simply a fortuitous wind that gave the demoralized Mongol fleet the opportunity to sail back to Korea. The Mongols may have realized they lacked the manpower to occupy southern Japan. Whatever the case, the Mongols are gone. For Japan, it's now time to grieve and rebuild. It's the following year that Mongol emissaries arrive in Japan, reiterating Kublai Khan's request to submit to Mongol rule. Hojo Tokamune, the de facto ruler of Japan, has been beheaded. Later emissaries suffer the same fate. So I wonder... Why do we know why the Mongols retreated? Because they seem to be doing good in the con. Like they've won basically every battle so far, at least every one that they've mentioned so far. Um, and I, I always heard that it was the weather that made them pull out. So I'm assuming it must have been the weather. Either that, or this must have just been an expeditionary force to kind of you know like poke and prod and see you know how good the Japanese military is, and then we'll send the full force. Was that the kind of strategy they were going with here? Tokamune knows the Mongols won't forget this. He constructs 12 miles of high stone walls on the coast of Japan. Another vital part of Japanese defense is prayer. The emperor, still an important religious figure in Japan, orders shrines to pray for peace and he curse still is the Mongols. To this day. He still is to this Well, maybe not so much now because more people are atheists than ever before, but... Um, you know, up until at least World War II, that's actually one of the reasons the Americans allowed the emperor to not be charged on war crimes and to stay the emperor is because Japan, you know, because of Shintoism being the religion, the emperor is seen as, you know, being a descendant of Am Amaterasu as literally a divine being. Um, so, yeah, like e even up till this day, the emperor is heavily associated with the, you know, the traditional religion of Japan. Yet the Mongol Empire only grows in power. They've crushed the last of China's southern Song dynasty, absorbed its mighty navy, and constructed a massive new fleet. In the years since the invasion, Kublai Khan has had time to orchestrate the downfall of Japan. In 1281, a Mongol fleet arrives on Tsushima. Defending samurai are crushed, villagers run to the mountains, but the Mongols follow the cries of fleeing children and hunt them down. They again occupy Iki and attack the mainland. 
but this time the guarded coastal walls prevent the Mongols from establishing a position on land. The Mongol fleet is forced to float ominously in the bay, planning island raids. The samurai sense vulnerability. They take sandbars and small boats out to the Mongol ships, clamber aboard, and fight. One, called Kawano Michiari, takes five followers and bounds over choppy seas in two small boats. As they near a Mongol vessel, an enemy archer kills his uncle. Two more arrows carve into Michiari's shoulder and left arm as he climbs aboard. He ignores the wounds, unsheathes his sword, kills a large Mongol, and captures an officer. Takazaki Suenaga is also eager to join the fray. He squeezes onto an outgoing Japanese boat, storms a Mongol ship, and attacks the crew. The Mongols are bleeding supply. Man, is this actual art from, like, like I don't know if, if it's from this period or, like, referring to this period, but is it, like, actual Japanese art or is it just done in the Japanese style? Because it looks really, like, well done regardless. But in midsummer, the momentum <laughs> seems to shift. <clears throat> Their massive southern fleet from the newly conquered southern China reaches Japan. The invading army is now three times as large as it was in the previous invasion. A tight battle at Takashima Island forces a Japanese retreat. Then, the skies blacken. The sails flutter, waves swell. A typhoon overtakes the bay, devouring hundreds of Mongol ships. Soldiers are thrown overboard, vessels dashed against the rocks. The surviving Mongol ships cut anchor and abandon the invasion. The next day, thousands of Mongols, dead and alive, wash up on Japanese beaches and float by on driftwood. One straggler, Chang, has been stranded on an island for three days without food. He and other survivors plan to cut down trees, build ships, and sail home. But they're captured by Japanese who are surveying the area. Uninterested in forgiveness, the Japanese execute every Mongol, Korean, and Northern Chinese they find. They view the Southern Chinese as old allies of Japan, only recently forced under Mongol control. They spared the lives of the newly submitted, saying that they were people of the Tang Dynasty and made them slaves instead. I, Chang, was one of them. I mean, at least you're alive, but I'm not sure how much better that is. It's like, guess what, buddy? You get to you get to live. The, the, the good news is you get to stay alive. The bad news is, uh, yeah, here's here's a uh, um, you know a scythe. Uh, get to work in the fields. The invasion is over. Takazaki Suenaga, now in his mid-thirties, will have his exploits documented in scrolls and will present testimonies and Mongol heads to receive rewards from the government. Samurai like Kawano Michiari will be honored as heroes. Kublai Khan and the Mongol Empire had famously laid claim to the entire universe, yet for the final time they've tried and failed to claim Japan. Yeah, so that, that was really interesting. I had, like, so I knew that the storms fucked them up, uh, which they did reference here. They referenced both the, both times. The, the first time there's possibly a storm, probably a storm. Um, you know, it seems like the Japanese version of the tale is that, you know, we scared them off even though they won every battle, which seems unlikely. Uh, it seems more likely that was either a probing attack just to, you know, test Japanese defenses and they realized they could easily take them out and then left to go get more reinforcements to, you know, just basically make sure they could do the job. Or possibly the storm had something to do with it, but it definitely doesn't seem like they scared them off. The second one, uh, yeah, that was definitely the storm. But it, it is really interesting, you know, how well the Mongols did against basically everyone they fought, right? Um, you know, at their peak, they were basically unbeatable. There was nobody that could compare with them. It's honestly kind of fascinating. They're one of the one of the most impressive militaries in history, and the fact that. You know, a lot of the time when you have these kind of, like, generals like Genghis rise to power, usually it collapses immediately after them. But with Genghis, it actually, you know, it's arguable that even though he's the most famous, that Kublai was a better leader. You know, Kublai expanded the empire far larger than Genghis ever did um, and was able to, you know, kind of bring it together a lot more than his grandfather was. Uh, although after him, it did quickly fall apart, but... Yeah, the, the Mongol Empire is honestly one of the most interesting empires in history because it's second in size only to the British Empire. And I feel like, aside from the fact that it existed, we rarely learn much about it. Part of that's probably because it never got to Western Europe. 
Um, I'm guessing that's it. That's probably a big part of it, but yeah. <coughs> anyway, excuse me. Anyway, let me know what you think below. Like, comment, subscribe. I'll see you guys in the next one.